And in this love nature, it gives you the ability to love your enemies. It gives you the ability to go higher than, than man can take you. It gives you the ability to go deeper and understand things that man can't understand. It gives you a wisdom that man can't have or can obtain only through God and his love and his nature and his power. Okay, well, they say to unsaved people a lot of times, that, well, I just don't want to give up this. I don't know if I'm ready yet. And I don't know if I can really do that. I don't think I really want to do that right now because me and my boyfriend's living together. And my son and his boyfriend is thinking about getting married nowadays. You know, they have kind of trashed the values and they want to move them into the church. But the real ideal is here that is in Ephesians chapter 3. This is very important Mm -hmm. that Paul says that it's hard to understand. He said it's actually impossible in Ephesians 3.19 to understand the love of God. Now, we are born of God. Amen. Our nature is love. Amen. They have the sin nature now in man that comes from Genesis chapter 3. Mm-hmm. That uh, sin nature with birth in him whenever he turned around and, and ate the fruit after the woman was deceived and gave him to eat and he ate it. Mm-hmm. So what they saw and um, is all the lust uh, of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life from 1 John chapter 2.15 is all birthed in the man. Amen. But they have overlooked the fact that we are born of love. And love can take us to a higher place than man can ever hope to go. Amen. It takes us higher in our morals. It takes us higher in our mind. It takes us higher in our ability. As a matter of fact, God loves every person. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it says that God will give us gifts that he doesn't give to regular men. Amen. Because we have power. That's what he talked about, Acts 1.8. Amen. Now, we know that they, uh, it says in Acts 1.8 that we shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon us. Amen. So the soil that these fruits in Galatians 5 is growing in is actually in our love, right? Amen. It is. It exactly is. It says, matter of fact, in 3.17 of Ephesians that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And this is rooted and grounded in love. Mm -hmm. So now, let's get down to the very part of this program because people today don't really understand what love is. And I see an attack going across our country now. In Missouri, in New York City, the other night they had like a few hundred thousand people out there ready to fight because a man was actually choked to death by a policeman, they said. And uh, somebody else was... uh, kill in Missouri that where they had all of that going on that but the ideal is that uh, some people claim that they are actually Christians involved in this do you believe that um maybe Christians are involved in it but they're deceived and they're getting caught up into worldly affairs I don't think a born-again Christian could be involved in it but maybe there is some deception went on with backsliders or whatever that's just my personal belief But the ideal is here that you cannot hate anybody and be a Christian. No, you can't. You can't be involved in things like that. And they have taken us today into a place in this country and tried to trash our Bible with all of these ideas that they come forth with on the history channels. And they've tried to trash our Bible and say that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene. And these are all these big corporations that actually run our government now. Mm -hmm. That's who they are. And... uh, we're going to uh, ask you, Michelle, what have you got there laid out for us? Well, I know when you said when people are doing you wrong and, and doing things and thinking that, oh, well, they're doing this to us and we need to get back at them. And, but the Bible teaches differently. It says in Romans chapter 12, verse 14, bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. And it goes on verse 17. It says recompense to men to no man evil for evil provide things honest in the sight of all men and if it be possible as much lieth as lieth in you live peaceably with all men and this is dearly beloved avenge not yourself but rather give place unto wrath for it is written vengeance is mine saith the lord i will repay saith the lord therefore if thine enemy hunger feed him if he thirst give him drink for in so, in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen. As you all say that, and, you know, Pastor was talking about um, how can you hate and be a Christian. I know in First John it talked about that um, quite often, and John was talking to the brethren. And over in First John chapter 3, it says, whoever hateth his brother is a murderer. You know, and this is talking about 
I believe it's talking to the Christians because the enemy will try to get things into your heart to try to get you to hate people. And we know that as long as you have hate, you can't grow in love. As long as you have bitterness towards somebody and unforgiveness, you can't grow in love. So I believe that this is important as you're, you know, saying this, that Christians need to guard their heart. And as you talked about your mind, it's important that you cast down imaginations because things can go on around you and thoughts can try to come in to make you try to hate somebody and think of what somebody did. And even as you're talking about certain things that took place, I know racism seems like it's trying to be stirred up and trying to get you to, um, the African-Americans hate the white people for what they did and hate this and hate that and choking this man and killing this man. And it wants to stir hatred up. And, you know, it's, it's like you said, as being Christians, we can't have any of that in our heart towards anybody. And especially, you know, if there's lies behind it. Okay, we got just a few minutes left. Uh, you, what do you want to show us there, Michelle? It says that in First John also uh, three fourteen. it says, We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth hateth, uh, loveth not his brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. So we know that we are in lo- have eternal life when we love each other. But the brother is very important. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 6, you know, we mentioned that earlier, Melanie, in one mm-hmm. of our programs. It talks about God is avenger of those that do his people wrong. Amen. And I don't care who it is. One thing that you find out in 1 Timothy that God has no respect of judgment. No, Without partiality, God mm-hmm. shows judgment. Amen. And there is no way that you can actually, uh, you know, vengeance. I seen a bumper sticker one time, vengeance is sweet. Well, that's a lie from hell. Mm-hmm. Ben, you know, anything like that is bad. We know people that sometimes, uh, you know, it's hard to bear things that you have to bear, but God is. is an avenger of all such people that touches his people. He is. So, you know, First Thessalonians 4, 6, what's it actually say, Melanie? It says, um, let no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. Well, you know that God fights our battle if you're a Christian. Luke 17 said it'd be better for him to have a millstone put around his neck and be cast into the sea as it would be to offend one of his little ones. You can't touch God's anointed. He said, touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. Mm -hmm. And I think people today has let the gospel just kind of leave America and they've gotten into preaching about money and all this kind of stuff. I want to say one more thing before we get ready to close our program for today that I believe we're struggling today, and I want you to notice that God is such a good God, I believe that powerful prayer people can change a lot of things. Amen. I think there's a lot of trouble, troubled uh, people in America, and I think that they want to uh, take martial law today and cover America with it because of all of this stuff that they're starting. I believe this is all a uh, funded operation by people that hate Christianity, They're funding all of these hate groups, and they're trying to start enough trouble so they can actually uh, have a reason to call the military in, take the guns out of America, and probably cause them a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I won't go into that any farther, but I think people need to really wake up, you know. it's it's, uh, Some people are not too very smart. You know, they believe everything they see. But I believe Christians need to have a prayer life. They need to be able to intercede. They need to pay, pray for one another, and they need to pray for our government leaders. Pray for them because, you know, uh, it says in First Timothy chapter 2 that we need to pray for kings and authority and all of these people. What else, Michelle? We've got 20 seconds. Well, I'll just say um, that we should learn, to, but the Bible says also to love your enemies and to, ble- and to bless them. So we have to love our enemies. We have to love them that hate us, and love worketh no evil. And love it thinketh no evil. That's right. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 that we have to love our enemies and we have to love them that hate us and pray for them to spitefully use us. The Bible talks about that very much. That's the gospel scheme. We have to turn the other cheek. You've been listening to the word of deliverance. If you live in the Dayton area, tune into this programs on your, all your access channels called Deeper Studies. The girl have great programs on there. And you might notice that 
Monday at 2 p.m. in the afternoon, you'll find Word of Deliverance. And Thursday night, I think you find Word of Deliverance at 10 p.m. And that's on all of DATV. And we thank those that have tuned in for today. If you'd like to have an uh, invitation, you've got one now. 518 North Pleasant Valley right here in Riverside. We love you. And we believe that God's got something for you if you're under the sound of my voice. Have a great day. Swinks Heavy Duty Equipment Repair, he does it all. Whether it's dozers, excavators, rollers, compactors, pumps, you name it, Steve can do it. You can contact Steve at 937-477-4886. He'll bring his truck, work on the site, or he'll come to your garage and repair your vehicles. He'll do you right. Again, Steve Swink at 937-477-4886. Try him. You'll be glad you did. Well, praise the Lord. I'm Pastor Inman, and thank you for uh, tuning into our program today. We're going to take you into a very interesting program. Uh, I've got with me Melanie and Michelle today, the two sisters that does deeper studies. They've been kind enough to help us with our radio programs, and we thank the Lord for them. Melanie, why don't you tell us uh, some of the stuff we've been discussing about the falling away of the church and why we see no power in the church today. Well, I believe it's because a lot of people have let their light go out. And, you know, over in the Old Testament, it talked about Eli. He had let the light go out in the house of God. And a lot of people have become, I believe, idle, and they let the light go out. So, in other words, light is, you technically, you think if you plug in a light, you get electricity and power. So, you let your light go out, you have no electricity and no power. And I believe that's the problem. People have become stagnated. They become um, complacent and no study life, no prayer life, and, and just go along with the world. One of the big commentaries that we have that came from one of the biggest Bible colleges in the United States today that's supposed to be uh, full of all the truth, he says that actually in the book of Peter, talks about this in the New Testament, that a perilous time shall come and men shall depart from the faith. Mm-hmm. And the Bible College uh, book, the big commentary, said, well, that don't mean they'll lose their salvation. He says they'll fall from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The Bible clearly says in Romans 8, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the children of God. How are you going to be led with evil spirits and tell me that you're a Christian? Amen. Okay, let's go into 1 Timothy. I want to take you into some things that's very important, and um, I believe they will be able to enlighten to a lot of people that are trying and they really love God and they want to go into ministry. They want to try to help people, but they really don't have any power in their life and there's no way most of them know how to learn. Amen. So let's talk about in um, First Timothy, let's go there and let's talk about what Paul had actually um, told Timothy when he said in First Timothy chapter 5, verse 21, he said, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels. Now, this wasn't suggestions. This was a charge Mm -hmm. that thou observe these things without preferring one another and do nothing by partiality. So now, he says in verse 22, Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partakers of other man's sins. Keep thyself pure. Amen. So when he's talking about being partakers of other men's sins, I think they come to me and they ask me, there's a woman, I won't give any names, but it's not necessary, but they says, pray for this woman and uh, that she's on dialysis and we need to see her healed. And I said, I will not pray that prayer. I said, I will pray that God will save her if she can be saved, Amen. but I'm not going to pray for her because she's on her fifth husband. And she all go, goes to square dances, and she goes out in the world and all of this stuff. And, you know, she was married to a preacher, but she got away from him. And, you know, then she got into this other stuff. And, you know, uh, it just didn't hardly go the way that I thought it should. So I guess the ideal is that I'm supposed to heal her or pray for her, and she could go back and get her sixth husband maybe. I don't know what they wanted. Mm-hmm. But I don't believe that we should be partakers of other people's sins. Amen. It's like the Bible said in First John. You don't bid the Antichrist God's speed. Amen. Don't help him or you be partakers of his sin. Amen. Now tell us the, the three things that we know about uh, actually laying on of hands 
and let's talk about the functioning of the hands and why they're not in the ministry today and why people are not using these. They completely ignore this, uh, this part of the Bible. So tell us, Michelle, where we're going with this. It says in 1 Timothy 2.8, he says, I will therefore that, that every man um, lift up, pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. Okay, so to lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting. You know, we talked about this on one of our uh, Bible lessons. I'm not sure which one it was. But when uh, they lifted up Paul's hands, Mm -hmm. or excuse me, when they lifted up Moses' hands in the Old Testament, you know, they were winning the battle. When they left his hands down, you know, they were losing the battle. The idea is that the word Judah takes the word hands And it says lifting up hands if you look up the name of Judah in the Hebrew. This is where the idea comes from. And this is why people lift up hands because it is a theme of the Bible, lifting up hands. Now, tell us what he means with holy hands with that wrath and doubting, Michelle. Well, you can't have any wrath in your heart or any hate towards anybody. And you can't have any doubt because he's a reward of them that diligently seek him and that he, that believe that he is God. Well, what about the putting your hand to the wrong thing? Well, yeah, you can't put your hands to the wrong thing because then you'll, be, you'll defile yourself and corrupt okay, yourself. Okay, to give the people out there in radio uh, a little understanding, Jezebel, uh, whenever they had killed her in Second Kings chapter 9, you don't have to turn our girls if you don't want to, but the ideal in Jezebel, she had uh, the dogs ate her, because she was a blasphemer and she killed the prophets of God and Elijah had prophesied to her the dogs would eat her and they did. But they didn't eat her hands, they didn't eat her skull and they didn't eat her feet. Her feet ran swiftly to bloodshed. It talks about that very um, openly in the book of Proverbs. And it also, her hands were to bloodshed and her mind was thinking on evil all the time. So she would not qualify to say the least. To lift up holy hands. No. <laughs> and her hands goes to the mark of the beast in Revelations 13. Amen. In the right hand. And whatever you put your hand to, that tells about who you are. Amen. Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. Amen. Oh, say so. Co- so holy hands without wrath and doubting. What's wrong with wrath? For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. So if you're mad and you're angry all the time, you need to get that under control mm-hmm. because that's a work of the flesh Amen. and it's not a fruit of the Spirit of God. Amen? Amen. Amen? And so these things like that war against the soul, it stops you from spiritual growth and it really takes the life of God out of you if you're back and forth in anger all the time. Now, we know that there's a way to get around that if people are struggling with that sin. You can repent from it, but... Some people believe that fasting and prayer is just a good way. Some days you have to shove the plate back, right? Amen. With that wrath and doubt. Doubt and unbelief will keep you from, from serving God. That's a work of the flesh too. Amen. But anyway, this is what the hands are for. Now in verse 22 uh, of chapter 5 in First Timothy, he says, Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither... Uh, that you be not partakers of his sins. What's different about this laying on of hands here, Melanie? This then, laying, you know, you've got other scriptures in the Bible that talk about the laying on of hands too. Tell us about both of them. Well, this laying on of hands is, like you said, about putting your hands on someone to pray for them, and you can't bless the devil. If someone's um, living a double life or or putting their hand to something that's wrong and, and they have judgment, I don't want to say judgment, but they're bringing things upon themselves, you can't. You can't bless the devil. And I'll give you an example. Um, Maybe someone struggles with diabetes and, you know, you pray for them and they get healed and they go back out and keep eating the wrong stuff. Um, Lots of sugars. And then they come back and say, well, my diabetes came back. You know, there's just certain things that you just don't do. So the other one is the laying on of hands is um, in 1 Timothy 4.14 where Paul's talking about... um, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which is given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. So this is the type of laying on the hands where you impart gifts unto um, someone as Paul did with Timothy. Okay, in 2 Timothy, what is it, 1-7? He talks about... 1-6? 2 Timothy, yeah, I think it is 1-6, 1-7. It's 1-6. Mm-hmm. He talks about 
<clears throat> the fact that he had actually laid hands on Timothy and the gifts were stirred up in him. Mm -hmm. At the time, they were imparted unto him, I meant to say. And the word we find in Strong's Bible Concordance is 329. And if you look it up in the Greek, you find out that it talks about here that as Paul is praying for him, that word uh, actually to stir up is to rekindle mm -hmm. the fire. Amen. And so many people, uh, as we have said, they let the fire go out in their life. Amen. Now, this is very important because Paul was uh, actually telling him in his personal letter. I think part of it is probably personal and part of it is strictly down to business. Uh -huh. But Paul loved Timothy and he called him in this letter different from the first one. He called him his beloved son. Mm -hmm. In First Timothy, he called him his own son. And uh, he was really telling him, I'm bringing you into remembrance here because uh, I remember, uh, you know, this, keep you in my prayers all the time. He was continually praying for him. So I don't think he was thinking that Timothy was actually uh, laying down on the job, but I believe that he was probably saying, hey, we need help here. And I think this is what the whole thing is about. We need help as Christians praying for one another praying that the gifts will come forth, and praying that the nine gifts of the Holy Ghost from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 would be manifested in us. Now, uh, tell us, Melanie, what are you reading? As I was looking at the word remembrance, um, and you talked about that the word stir means rekindle, and it goes along to say repetition, is something that we have to remind ourselves. And, and also, there's a scripture that says, iron sharpeneth iron. And with Paul, I believe that he sharpened Timothy. And it's important, you know, that we encourage one another in our gifts, because if we don't, this is something that we can lose. And there's a, a statement that one may say, if you don't use it, you lose it. And I believe it's important that we do do this with the repetitiousness and and with our prayers because prayer, you know, I've learned so much myself that prayer is so important. I know our time's ticking, so. It's gone, but okay, I understand. This is three ways then we use the hands. We lift them up. They're a very powerful instrument. Whenever you use them to lift your hands up to God, you know, I believe the devil is getting by with a lot of stuff today he shouldn't be getting by with. And I believe when we lift up holy hands and begin to interceding for people and to pray for people, I believe God will give us the battle just like he gave it to uh, Moses in the days when Aaron and Hur lifted up his, his hands. Amen. And I believe that we're struggling today because of the lack of prayer. Now, they've shut mm -hmm. down prayers in all the schools today. Yes. And they shut down prayers in most of the churches. I didn't yeah. know the churches were funded by the government till I found out, you know, recently in the past couple of three years that there are some major churches in America that's basically funded with the government. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, this is very powerful, the hands, and you find out they're powerful in laying on of hands. Mark 16, and this is very good in 2021, he says, Now, these signs shall follow them that believe. In mm -hmm. my name they shall what? Cast out devils, heal the sick. Lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So we use our hands as an instrument for God. Amen. You know, testifying of our lifestyle. And then when you look at this last one that you mentioned, we lift our hands and lay them on, lay hands on people that they might receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. But let me tell you, if you don't have nothing in your life to begin with, there's nothing going to help you to lay hands on somebody else. Mm -hmm. You know, I believe that prayer and fasting was what they were doing in Acts 12 when they got Peter out of jail when they were praying and the angel went in and got him. Mm -hmm. I believe if you go back and look in the scriptures that you'll th find out in Acts chapter 5 that Peter was prayer praying and fasting probably whenever, uh, you know, his shadow was healing people. Mm -hmm. God is a supernatural God. Now, I'm going to say this before we go off the air. I believe healing is a supernatural gift, and I believe God wants it into people's lives, and it comes to be imparted unto you upon receiving the Holy Ghost, but you must kindle the fire. Some people are Matthew 25, they have let the fire of God go out. I believe the five wise virgins has to keep the fire going. You can look in Leviticus chapter 10, you find out that the sons of Aaron, as far as I can read, they were killed because they had strange fire. Mm -hmm. I think it is verse 10 says that they were drinking alcohol. And this is the thing about it. People have let these things come into the church. Mm -hmm. They've stopped prayer meetings. They've stopped fasting. Amen. And the power of God has just gone out the door. Mm -hmm. You've been listening to the word of deliverance. 
I want to thank you for tuning in today. If you'd like to drop us a letter, why don't you do it at 518 Pleasant Valley, two words, and that's Dayton, Ohio, 45404. Just write Brother Inman, I-N-M-A-N. If you want to write to girls, just make a note in there somewhere for the girls. That's fine. And that's 518 Pleasant Valley, Dayton, Ohio, 45404. You've been listening to the Word of Deliverance. It's been a pleasure coming to you today. Remember, prayer and fasting change things. Keep your fire burning. I believe there's a lot of people walking in darkness today that need prayer. Have a great day. Hello, I'm Pastor Inman, and thank you for tuning into our program for today. We've got a subject to you today that you don't want to get away from. We're talking about the uh, drink no longer a little uh, water, but drink wine for thy stomach's sake and thy often infirmities. Now, you know, we're really dealing with a lot of treacherous demons today in the church world. And, you know, they want to take our Bible and trash it. And they want to do all of these kind of things. And uh, they want to trash the teaching of living right. And they want to uh, have a lot of people that don't know how to rightly divide the Bible to, like, uh, tell people what this means. So, Melanie, we're going to choose you today and let you lead us into this and uh, tell us, exactly what 523 where we're going with this so we're in first timothy 523 uh-huh. talking about paul's command to timothy where he said i charge thee enforce these things timothy he says now do it without partiality uh-huh. now he says drink no longer water is that something people should be doing today um not drinking water that's what he says hmm i mean just in general A lot of people tell you to drink plenty of water, so... Well, any health general, uh, any guy that's a czar, a Uh health person, you know, they come up with the idea to flush yourself out with water. Mm -hmm. That's what some of these things are, like selenium. Uh That's one of the things they use. Uh, Alpha lipoic acid is another (laughs) thing you use to kind of flush yourself out and drink plenty of water. The metals that's in you that you've accumulated through, through drinking of this water in this world. Amen. Uh, especially if you don't drink uh, good non-fluoridated water, uh-huh. you're probably full of metal. Yeah. But anyway, uh, those kind of things lead to a lot of sickness. So I wouldn't believe that people should be listening to this drink no longer water. i tell you what let's right. do. Mm-hmm. Michelle, you've studied this as much as anyone I know. Why don't you look in First Timothy 5.23... And what we're going to do, we're going to take the people into the Greek, and we're Mm -hmm. going to show them how to use Strong's Bible Concordance. That's the best book I know that goes with the King James Bible. Mm -hmm. And we're going to show them, even though the King James Bible has a little flaw, just a little flaw here that uh, is not very hard to overlook. Mm -hmm. If you're a Christian and your Bible read, you must know that there's a problem because the Old Testament doesn't allow any of the priests to drink wine. Right. The Bible said in uh, 1 Timothy, it actually says in 2 Peter that we're a royal priesthood, Mm -hmm. a holy nation, and that we are a royal people. Amen. We are a priest. Amen. So anyway, let's tell them a little bit about, I mean, we've got some scriptures here. You want to start in the Old Testament. Tell us why that we should uh, have a red flag to go up where we should be searching the scripture out in the Greek instead of taking somebody's word for it. Well, and we know that in Leviticus ten nine, he told the um, sons of Aaron that they were not to drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when thou go into the tabernacles of the congregation, lest ye die. And they had strange fire. Also, there's Ooh. another um, one, Isaiah five twenty two. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink. Okay, let's look at this in Leviticus again, Leviticus 10. It says they drank something in verse 10, didn't it? Yes. So they had been drinking and Aaron lost both of his sons. Let's tell the people what wine does to you and what is the the strange fire. And how do you relate to that, Michelle? Well, when they get into drinking, then... They get into that strange fire, which is not of God. It gets into um, something, another spirit other than God. Okay, let's give them a little clearer thing. In, uh, what is it? Uh, Numbers chapter 15, we talked about 
the man who went out and gathered sticks on the Sabbath day, Mm -hmm. wasn't it? Okay, when the man went out and gathered sticks on the Sabbath day, he had intentions of building his own fire. Mm -hmm. The Old Testament ideal is that God is the fire. You know, he come before Moses as a fire in a Mm -hmm. burning bush. You know, he answered by fire in the sacrifices they offered up. And you find out in the book of Matthew chapter 3 that um, actually John the Baptist said that the one coming after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to loosen the latches of. He will baptize you with Holy Ghost and fire. If you've drank an alcohol, it perverteth judgment. Now, it not only perverts judgment, it because you to see things clearly mm-hmm. in a different way. It does. Amen. I hope I said that right. It does. Now, the ideal is here that Alcohol perverted people. Mm-hmm. You can't see with the fire of God and drink alcohol too. Amen. We know that some people live in darkness. Alcohol will cause you to do the wrong thing every time. Amen. So we know that we have the fire of God. It reveals things hidden in darkness. Mm-hmm. Amen. We're baptized. Cloven tongues of fire set up on them in Acts 2 when they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Mm-hmm. Tongues that were of fire, cloven tongues of fire, reveals people things to them that they would never see otherwise. Mm -hmm. We all need the tongue of fire. Amen. But you know, now let's go just a little bit farther. Ben, you've uh, delivered them from (laughs) Leviticus chapter 10. (laughs) Tell us where else we're going. Well, um, if you want to look in the uh, Greek of what it really says, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23, it says drink, the word drink is 5202, and that's in the strong concordance in the Greek. And that says to be a drinker of water, a water drinker. And that <clears throat> it says to abstain from vinous beverages. In other words, water. we're not to drink any grape juice or anything like that that possibly might be fermented or even unfermented. Right. He didn't allow that. Right. Okay, so he says drink water, nothing from the vine. Right. Wow. So that is really different than what they believe it. That's just the word drink. Right. So now we've got two more words here. We've got no longer, and then we've got water. Mm-hmm. Let's see what these mean, and then we're going to show the people, by the way of radio if we can, how to actually determine what this really says. Okay, okay let's take the word here, Melanie, mm-hmm. like no longer. What does that mean? Well, the word no is not in there, but the word Longer is 3370, and it says Medes, like the Persian. Okay, so the Medes apparently drank a lot of water. Yes. The Medes had the secrets of health, and mm-hmm. I read one article where they were their longevity was thought to be longer than that of ordinary people because they learned the secret of flushing their stuff out with good, clean water. Amen. Mm-hmm. So it says drink water, uh-huh. nothing from the vine, Medes... Now, what does the word water mean at the last? And then we can know what this first part of this sentence says. Well, the word water is the same exact um, number for the word drink, 5202. And that's the one that says water drinker. So let me get this straight here so the people can understand it. 5202 Mm -hmm. in the Greek under Strong's Bible Concordance says to drink nothing but water. That's what it says. Then you go to the Medes. You've got the, the word no longer. It says Medes and the Persians. Uh-huh. Then you go to the word water, and it actually says drink nothing but water. Amen. So let's read this, how we wrote it out. Now, this is how people, this is how these companies make these Bibles. They try to go in it and mm-hmm. write this stuff out. So let's write this out for the people. It says drink water, nothing from the vine. Mm-hmm. Medes and Persians. They drink water, nothing from the vine. Mm -hmm. Now, how can you get this? And I'm not trying to change the Bible or anything. There's just a little print there that is a little bit off. And people, I don't know if it was intentional or I don't know how it happened, but it's just not brought out properly. This is one of the places where they've used this to try to corrupt the minds of good people trying to serve the Lord and telling them that they can drink wine and sit down and have a beer and there's no difference and watch a football game. You know, these kind of things, people have to make their choices every day. So if you learn how to do this, we learn how to take a pencil, sit down, write these things out with the Greek, then you can tell what a a scripture says. So it actually says, drink nothing but water. Medes and Persians drink nothing but water. Mm -hmm. And remember, wine 
is a, brings forth often infirmities. Mm-hmm. That's the way I would interpret that. So we got wine today. I mean, it's connected to cirrhosis of the liver. It is. You know, it's connected to brain cells. I remember now years ago we had a study where we did how many brain cells were killed with alcohol. Mm-hmm. It brings down your IQ level and everything else. And God is, is not in the business of corrupting people's mind. Yeah. So they want to tell us about turning the water to wine. They want to say, well, gee, let's turn the water to wine. Well, you know, I really don't believe he turned it into alcoholic beverages. Mm-hmm. He said talking about new wine. Mm-hmm. Now, he said, the man at the feast, he says, most people save the old wine to last, and they gave us the best, or, you know, they saved the bad wine to last, and, you know, first we drank the, the good wine, but you have did the opposite, and you gave us the bad wine first, and now we have the good wine. And the idea was it was new wine, and this is what the blood of Jesus is all about. Amen. Let's take a look in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Michelle, and let's tell them, because we've got a few minutes left, let's tell them about the need for the blood of Jesus and how the covenant is displayed with communion in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, when you look at the communion... You know, you'll find that Paul had some great comments about it, ordained of the Lord. Mm-hmm. Tell us, Michelle, what it says about in the night that uh, he says this. Take a read it to us. He says in verse 24, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the same manner, also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this is the cup. Is this cup is the New Testament in my blood? This do as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. See, if people don't understand the, the covenant that's in the Bible, they don't understand this. Amen. But he uses this and he says that this is the cup that, he's, that they supped. And it's the testament. This is the covenant of God that's in his blood. So what happens is I tell God all of this time, Lord, I come into you, you come into me. We go into the body of Christ, right? Amen. And then he comes into us. Mm -hmm. He comes into our heart. Mm -hmm. Now give us a little illustration there, Melanie, from Ephesians chapter 5, and tell us what he says about Christ and the church being one. Amen. Well, it talks about Christ and the church being one. It also talks about real quick, if I can say it, it says, Be not drunk with wine but be filled with the Spirit. So, you know, that's part of coming into one with Christ and His Spirit comes in you. And, and you know, once you're, you come in covenant with Him, you, you have the mind of Christ and you have His Spirit and you become one. And it says, therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be subject to their husbands. Is that the verse you was looking for where it talks about the church? Pastor, you said yeah. um, in Ephesians right. chapter 5. And, and it talks about as a wife going into the husband and joined unto his wife, they shall, they too shall be one flesh. And in verse 32, this says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church and how we're supposed to be one with Christ and come unto him. So people don't know what the covenant is. Actually, whenever the people of the Jewish people took a Passover and they had the Passover meal, they ate of his divine flesh. Jesus said in John 6, I am the bread of life. Amen. So, you know, this is the whole idea. You must eat of his flesh. And they mm-hmm. talked about this when he said, except you drink of my blood and eat of my flesh, you have no part of me. Many right. of them left because they did not understand. Mm-hmm. But the ideal is Jesus comes to you. You drink of his blood. You're washed in his blood. Mm-hmm. You know, they purchased us and ransomed us and took us away from the devil and the world. And, you know, we eat of his flesh, and he comes in us. That's what we do when we break the bread in symbolism. Amen. He went on to say, some not discerning the Lord's body are sick and weak. And so uh, this is exactly what we're talking about. I think we are the, the, the in his body, and he mm-hmm. is in us. And that's where the blood of Jesus goes. Amen. Therefore, you can't compare the blood of Jesus with an alcoholic substance Mm-mm. that destroys more people than any other way. Amen. In the Hebrew, remember this, the word blood says what? Grape juice. Grape juice. You're exactly right. This is why we use grape juice in our communion. 
Amen. I'm Pastor Inman, and you've been listening to the Word of Deliverance. I hope this program has been good to you. If you'd like to write to Pastor Inman, write to Pastor Inman, I-N-M-A-N, and the address is 518 Pleasant Valley, two words, and that's Dayton, Ohio, 45404. If you'd like to uh, send us an email, send it to Pastor Inman at att.net. I trust you enjoyed our program. I'll say again, remember, tomorrow, same station, and um, I'll be looking for you there. Have a great day. Hello, I'm Pastor Inman, and thank you so much for tuning in today. I want you to know we love you, and we appreciate you for actually being here with us on this channel. You know, today is the day the Lord hath made. Maybe you've having a hard day. Maybe you've been sick. A lot of people are, are troubled with cancer. And uh, I believe maybe if you are, you need to send us an email. Do you know we've got a midnight prayer every Friday night, and we always pray for people. We've seen so many miracles that it's hard to explain. Send your emails, or if you want to write to Pastor Inman, write to me at 518 Pleasant Valley, Riverside, Ohio, or Dayton, Ohio, 45404. Get a pencil, and I'll give that to you one more time. If you want to email me, email me your term or, you know, what they have said about you if you're sick, and uh, if you would, and we'll put you in our midnight prayer box and be praying for you. I believe God's got a miracle for you if you're under the sound of my voice. My address again, just write Brother Inman, I-N-M-A-N, and that's 518 Pleasant Valley. Dayton, Ohio, 45404. Again, we love you very much, and we'll be faithful and pray over your uh, prayer request. And no, you don't need to send any money. You don't have to send no money, especially for anything where we're praying for the sick, because that would not be right. You know, I don't believe that we should be taking money for praying for the sick. That's not an issue. Jesus never did do that, and I don't think we should. It's different. If you want to give some other time, you can. But here, we'll just leave it like this. Today, our program is going to take you into great depth about the challenge of every Christian. And I believe people are being challenged today with hate groups, things going across the United States. I think there's racism going across the United States. There's hate groups, and there's all of these kind of doctrines from the pits of hell that tries to steal the life of God out of you. Now tell us, Melanie, exactly what the Christian challenge is today and how it relates to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and how Paul had challenged the believers who were actually slaves. Amen. Well, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, he's talking to the servants about um, being submissive and, and loving to their masters. Even, you know, there's a scripture that talks about even to the foreword, you're supposed to be, you know, loving and treat him as a brother and still, you know, do the work for him that, that you're supposed to do. And it's part of having that love nature and, and being able to love him, knowing that you're doing it for God. And I like even over Colossians says, it talks about the servants. Obey your masters, not according to, you know, I service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. So this was his challenge to the servants at obeying the masters and loving him and entreating him as a brother. Well, you know, that's not easy all the time. No, it's not. You know, I did a lot of study in slavery in the days of Rome. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I found out that uh, a master could actually kill his slave at any time without having any problem or any repercussion because he actually owned him. Mm -hmm. Some of the a a masters were actually good to their slaves. They actually uh, saved money for them and give them an option at a later date to buy out if they wanted to and go about their own business. Uh, you know, of doing whatever they wanted to in life. But some of the people, it had nothing to do with racism. Mm -hmm. It had everything to do with just people making bad decisions and, you know, things happen in life. People would uh, sell their children. You would think nobody would ever do anything like mm -hmm. that. But in the days of Roman Empire, people would sell their children actually for money, maybe if they had a financial crisis. And sometimes they would sign papers and if they didn't pay back the money on time themselves, that they themselves would be taken into slavery. So it was never a racial thing. But here, Paul challenging us, wouldn't it be really easy to hate a master that told you to get up at midnight and do this or get up and do that and, 
You know, it would be easy to hate people like that if they mm -hmm. work you hard and give you a whole lot of wood to chop or something like that. What are you waiting for there, Michelle? Tell us where you're at with this. Well, it says, um, let's, let if, as many servants as are under the yoke count their masters worthy of all honor that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. So Christian character is the idea. Right. Amen. So if you're not displaying Christian character, loving people and being nice to them, Probably you're not a Christian. Right. Mm -hmm. You're blaspheming the name of God and you're blaspheming his doctrine. Mm -hmm. So we know that uh, you know them by their fruits. Amen. And in the verse I was talking about earlier is 1 Peter 2.18. It says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Wrongfully. And what glory is if you get buffeted for your sins and take it patiently? But if you do well, suffer for it and take it patiently, this is acceptable unto God. And it goes along to say how Jesus was example. And, you know, he even took on the form of a servant. How humble Jesus was for him to take on a form of a servant. And people came against him. And people, you know, smote him in the face. And they slapped him. And it said there was no sin. Neither was any gall found in his mouth. So I believe as Jesus was an example for us. And he was, you know, beat. And, and, and he suffered as a servant. We're supposed to gird ourselves likewise with this mind. Even unto our masters. Okay, so you said when there was no sin. You mean Jesus did not display any anger he didn't he said in the garden he said think not that i could presently call 12 legions of angels amen but he didn't do that he didn't he said in john 12 he said for this purpose came i forth right so nobody killed jesus he gave up his life he did and these evil people mm -hmm. was not hard to persuade to kill him mm -hmm. <laughs> but the ideal is that uh, jesus loved and that's who he is and a person that has the love of god mm -hmm. You should not be able to stir up anger within them. Right. Now, I know we all struggle a little bit, but, you know, basically you have to, I had a time in my life where I was struggling with going over the hill, like the threshold, we call it. You know, you go through the threshold and, you know, you go into the other side and sometimes it's not that good. Anger was dealing with me. Mm -hmm. I didn't have it all the time, but man. Things would get happen, and they just wouldn't stop. And you, especially if you're tired, you had no rest, you've been Amen. up all night, and things are bothering you, then things will come to the surface. Amen. So let's go. Let's tell them about this next verse. There are some people that don't teach about the love of Jesus. Now, I'm not going to stop totally about Jesus because Pilate said, I found no fault in him. Uh -huh. And that's three times in the 19th chapter of St. John. Uh -huh. When he found no fault in Jesus, that means he could not, show anger, which right. they know was lust. They could not show any violence. Mm -hmm. They couldn't show any of these things that was evil in Jesus. Amen. No works of the flesh. Amen. So now tell us, Michelle, in verse 5 in First Timothy, what about these people that don't teach this type of doctrine? Well, it talks about, um, in this doctrine, it says, uh, perverse disputings of men, corrupt minds, and destitute of truth, supposing that gain great gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself so he told people that have corrupt minds and that are destitute of the truth he told them to withdraw yourself from them mm -hmm. and then it so goes on it says in verse four it says that he that is proud knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words uh, whereof cometh envy and strife and rel relings evil surmisings and that word doting, you look it up in the Greek, it talks about um, being sick, diseased morally. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's tell them a little bit. I told you that five, but I meant three. If any man teach otherwise, mm -hmm. in other words, if he's not telling you to show the love of God and how you love people, it says uh, if he consents not to hold some words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, then it tells a list of things that he is. Then he's proud. He's knowing nothing. Then he's dotting about questions. Then he's strifing about words. And from all of this, you get envy, strife, railing, and evil surmising. Now, this actually, when you look at it in the Greek, Michelle, this talks about sickness. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about, there's a lot of sickness in the church today. Yep. So people that don't teach this, Let's tell them the two words in this verse number three and four 
that actually leads to sickness. When people do not display the love of Jesus and they don't have it in their life, tell us about this word wholesome and doting. Well, wholesome is the word that means um, whole, to be healthy. It's something that makes, when you're in the right doctrine and you're into healthy doctrine, the doctrine of Christ. So are you saying that this strengthens your spirit and it, it don't war against your soul? Right. When you're teaching the right thing. Right. But if you're not, then you've, you're not going to have wholesome doctrine. Tell us the next part. It, it says, uh, doting, it says to be sick by implication of a diseased appetite to hanker after. And it says figuratively to hop upon. Then it goes in to say, um, it goes on to say disability, morally disability, disease, infirmity, and sickness. So that's what the word means in the Greek. Right. When you go to Strong's Bible Concordance, the Greek word means that. Right. So the Greek word actually means sickness. Mm Mm-hmm. This is so sad that we've got so many things like this that goes on. You know, you would never think something like this is here in 1 Timothy chapter 5 that actually talks about sickness and health. Amen. Amen. In these two verses, and that's verses 3 and 4, you've got these two words. For those of you out there who already want to write them down, look them up in Strong's Bible Concordance in the back. It says wholesome, and the other word in verse 4 is about doubting, D-O-T-I-N-G. Mm-hmm. And these are very critical words if you understand how to stay healthy. Amen. Can I say something real Go quick right about ahead. that word wholesome? At the very end, it went to another number, and it said to grow. And I like that. And it went on along to say it wax and enlarge and grow up and give the increase. And these, you know, these healthy words is what helps you to grow as is a Christian. Is that like developing your Christian nature? Oh, definitely. Definitely. And you know, without these wholesome words, you are going to be sick. You're going to be diseased spiritually and physically. Is that saying that if you don't have these wholesome words, you'll never develop spiritually? That's what it says. Is that why you see these people that's been to church all these years and never changed a bit? Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. They stop growing, you know, and they start hearing words that, that they're talking about here, these doctrines that are not lining up with wholesome teaching, true doctrines. It's like a perverted doctrine. Well, you know what else I think is very informative here? Mm -hmm. We've got a couple of more minutes. Is it goes right on to talk about that these same men that are uh, actually, they're perverse in their mind, Mm -hmm. and they've got a lot of problems. They even go to the doctrine of godliness is great gain. Uh How many preachers and people do you think that they're teaching today godliness is great gain? A lot of pastors and preachers. Well, it says that, you know, certainly we brought nothing in this world. We can't carry anything out. Right. He goes on to say that these will bring a great, um, this, they which will be rich. They actually fall into a lot of temptations and snares and many hurtful and, and lusts. And they drown men in destruction and perdition. When you look at the word destruction and perdition, you find out that you can actually go to hell. For having a lot of money and chasing a lot of money. You can. I think when God calls you out of darkness into his marvelous light, mm-hmm. that you should support the gospel. You should have a good prayer life. You should spend your time, take enough time out. And remember, nothing is as valuable as your very soul. Amen. Amen. I mean, how are you going to compare your soul? Jesus says, you, you know, if you gain the whole world and lose your soul you're pretty sad amen got another minute it says godliness verse six but godliness with contentment is great gain so that's how to really get ahead be content with being godly because if you're godly god will bring things into your life amen Amen. and then um he says he told timothy for the love of money is the root root of all evil which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Well, we've got a lot of people today that get on this. Uh, TBN's a good one when they tell you about, mm-hmm. they take up all of their share and stuff, how that you're going to be blessed if you give this and blessed if you give that. We believe in giving. That's the only way that we're able to stay in existence. But at the other hand, we know that we are delivered, and at the time of trouble, we have some intrinsic value within us. Amen. The Bible says that there is treasures called wisdom and knowledge and they're within us amen god amen. knows what we have need of jesus says you know don't seek things the gentiles seek for amen. 
But seek ye first the kingdom of his God, and he'll add all of these things unto you. Amen. You've been listening to the Word of Deliverance. My name is Brother Inman. Our address again is 518 Pleasant Valley, two words, Dayton, Ohio. Hello, I'm Pastor Inman, and thank you for tuning in to our program for today. Today, we got some great things for you, so don't change that dial. I believe God's going to tell you, you know, um, through our preaching, through our ministry today, if you pay close attention, I believe you're going to get something extra from God that would just help you to get over some of the things you may be facing today. Many people today are facing financial situations. They're facing broken marriages, broken homes, children dead from overdoses of the drugs and children shot in the hospital. And, you know, people, a lot of people are discouraged today. So I want to spend a little time and help you today to be able to get over some of the humps. And today, I think because of what people hear from the pulpits, I think their lives are in jeopardy because a lot of people are preaching, positive preaching. They're preaching on things that don't even relate to the Bible. And a lot of people don't even know the difference. And so, Michelle, we're going to ask you today, <clears throat> tell us from First Timothy chapter 6 where we're going and how we're going to show people today how that they can actually have a more peaceful life. Amen. Well, in verse 3, it says, If any man teach otherwise, he's talking about t- uh, the t- teachings in the, of Christ, he says, And consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strives of words, of, of whereof cometh envy, strife, and relics, and evil surmisings. And if you look in the word wholesome, it talks about um, health and being able to grow morally. In a moral sense. Right. Okay, so it also talks about, and I guess to give the people a little more insight to what we're talking about, this first part of chapter 6 talks about a challenge that God put to Timothy, and he told him, if any man don't, don't teach these things, he said, such as wholesome doctrine, and the word wholesome talks about the health It actually brings health to people, and it should bring prosperity to them and help them to be healthy. You know, I believe this is something that most people are going to overlook in their Bible study. Amen. It says in verse 6, he said, here's what's wrong with this guy. He's proud, knowing nothing, but dotting, D-O-T-I-N-G. That word is the word for what? To To be sick, by implication, diseased. Uh, um, appetite, and then it goes on to say morally disability. So you get people that figure every day, well, you know, we don't have to really uh, preach the scriptures. Joel Osteen says he don't preach the scriptures. That wasn't his calling of God. Right. But my Bible tells me the signs shall follow them that believe. Amen. And faith comes by hearing by the word. Amen. But anyhow, I would have never thought here in First Timothy 6, 3, and 4 that it talks about what you actually teach can cause you to be in sickness or health. Amen. Now, this was a challenge to Timothy because actually he was told that he's to teach men that if they were a slave, they had to love their owner, and Amen. especially if he was a saved person himself. Amen. So, you know, a lot of people can't love their boss. I know some guys work in a factory, and they'd probably like to kill him Amen. because they're not saved. Right. But, you know, if they get saved, they have a different idea. But it was a challenge. But Paul was talking about Christian character, loving your brother, and plus loving the world too, and having a good outlook and a good spirit as a Christian. Amen. So this is where it goes. But now what it gets a little bit uh, in verse 5, it kind of goes a little bit farther. People that get out of teaching the right thing, uh, they kind of get caught up in teaching things that kind of lead them away from the real doctrine that's in Jesus Christ Amen. and what Jesus does. He's used here twice as an example in chapter 6. Uh, he, he's used over here uh, two different times. And so what we'll do, we'll go ahead and let you take us into verse 5. It says, Those that are perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, they're destitute of the truth, and they suppose that great gain is godliness. And he says, From such turn away. And or from such withdraw thyself. But he says in verse 6, But godliness with contentment is great gain. 
For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptations and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Well, you look at the word destruction and perdition, these things lead to hell in a short life. Amen. So, you know, it doesn't stand to reason that these guys with these prosperity messages that would like tell you that you're going to get so much money for this and that. We've got all kind of crazy doctrines. People selling prayer shawls for money Amen. and prayer shawls telling you, oh, I can feel such an anointing. We know that's a lie. The Holy Spirit replaced the prayer shawl. Amen. He is your covering. You know, so we see these corrupted things on TV, people trying to get money to pay TBN for their programs and all of this. But nevertheless, the Bible said that if you fall into temptations, a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men and send them into hell. You know, a lot of men do have the love of money. Amen. Oh, I don't love it. I just love having it. <laughs> so, you know, the whole thing about it is you've got some people that actually believe that. And it says some men, in verse 10, after coveting after the money, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You know, one of the things I think is fascinating, look in verse 5. It says, from these kind of men that teach this stuff, withdraw yourself. Amen. Get away from them. Amen. You know, the evil communications corrupt good manners. Amen. And, you know, I believe God wants us to be satisfied with what we've got. You know, thank God for your health. And, you know, to remember in communicating with Christian people that's born-again believers, you better know what the word communicate means. Amen. It has the word, and a bookkeeper would understand this, it has the word pecuniary mm -hmm. mixed with that word communicate to Christian people. The pecuniary is a word for money. Amen. And, you know, some people, do they have money in everything that they do with Christianity? It's related to money. But Jesus said in the book of Luke, tell us what he said over here in Luke chapter 12, Michelle. I'll read it to him here in verse 29. He said, And seek ye not what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of a doubtful mind. So, you know, God doesn't want us to be doubtful. If we're born again, you know, greater is he that's within us than he that's within the world. Amen. He says, so, uh, for all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your father knoweth what you have need of before you even ask. He said, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. Fear not, little flock, he said, it's my father good pleasure to give unto you the kingdom. So God is going to meet our needs, especially if you're not one that's throwing away money. Amen. If you're not one that's acting stupid with money, buying lotto tickets and, you know, giving your son after he spends his money for cigarettes that you're giving him money to live off of during the week. <laughs> I'm sorry, God ain't going to replace that. Amen. But I believe if you're living for God and you're doing the right thing with your money, especially if you're a tithe payer, Amen. you know, God's not going to let you go uncompensated. Un, uh, you know, God is going to take care of you. That's just what God does. Amen. But now we've got some solid, uh, very, very things that are, I can't begin to tell you what all the hurtful lusts are that drown men. It's just the things that people go through for money. Amen. Now, I know that some people erred from the faith. What does he say in verse 11 in 1 Timothy 6? He, told, he tells them, he says, but thou, old man of God, won't you flee these things, leave these things alone, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, and patience, and meekness, which are the fruits of the Spirit. He says, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before <laughs> many witnesses. Okay, let's talk about the good profession that Jesus uh, have professed. Tell us what it says in verse, uh, I guess we could use that verse there in 12, right? Mm -hmm. Verse 12 and 13, he says, I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. Now, we kind of had a little laugh about that because so many people, you know, they don't understand what the word profession means. And how that Jesus, whether it says confession or profession, it doesn't really matter. Right. The ideal is that Jesus said what? Thou sayest. 
thou sayest. Jesus didn't say anything. Are you the king of the Jews? Tell me right now. Jesus said, for this purpose came I forth. Amen. Tell me right now, don't you know that I could crucify you? Are you the king of the Jews? Who are you? Thou sayest. Jesus never said anything because it is written, the Lord will fight your battle and to turn the other cheek. Amen. And also, Paul, I mean, Pilate had a, a, profe- a good confession about Jesus also, too, saying that in ni- St. John chapter 19, verse 4, he says that I find no fault in him. He said it three times, and that's right. three times for power. Uh-huh. And that is really shows you that Jesus had nothing in his heart. Amen. And I believe if you've got no nothing in your heart, you can answer like Jesus did. Amen. In other words, why should you get up and lower yourself down on the level of anger and hate and all of these things, which will take you away from God? So he said to this verse 13 in 1 Timothy 6, I charge thee in the sight of God. Amen. Who quickeneth all things. In other words, the word here quickeneth means life. Mm-hmm. He's the one give life to all things in heaven and earth. Without him, there is no life. But he said, this is a charge in the sight of God. And you know who Jesus Christ, before Pontius Pilate, had a good confession. Amen. He said, thou sayest, let God fight your battle and don't try to fight your own battle. Then if you do this, you're going to look in verse 14. Tell us what it said. This verse, is, go ahead. Verse 14, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearance of our Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you're to let God fight your battles and keep things out of your life. Remember, Amen. don't seek after things of the world. Now, if you want to go back to what I read to you in Luke 12 about seek ye first the kingdom of God, tell us, Michelle, about our prayer meetings on Friday night. Well, we have a good uh, midnight prayer meeting at, at from 1030 to 1230, and we always beat up on the devil every night. And we also, also we have a um, Friday night service that starts at 7 and good preaching and we have a good service. And then at nine o'clock, uh, 930, we have snacks and beverages after services. But we just have a we get in and we just pray for the for those that are lost. And we pray for the our nation and and for those that need help. If people can't come to our midnight service, I realize that's far out for some people. They're certainly willing to come to our seven uh, o'clock service. And if they can't do that, they can send us a prayer request if they're out of town. Send it to uh, 518 Pleasant Valley, two words, and that's Dayton, Ohio, 45404. I believe if you do that, we'll put your prayer request in a box and pray for it on our Friday night midnight service. Remember, Paul and Silas got out of jail with the prayers at midnight, and God does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I believe if God did it for Paul and Silas, he'll do it for you. One of the other things we can tell you about, if you're in the Dayton area, come be with us at 930 Sunday morning. We got Melanie. She does a great job with our Sunday school program. Michelle, I know you got some anointed songs to sing and get in and have a good time every Sunday morning and every Friday night. We enjoy our services. Everybody is welcome. You know, Deeper Studies, uh, Michelle, is your uh, actual TV program that you do on all the access channels. Tell us what times that comes on on Monday and Friday. Well, on Mondays we come on at 9, uh, 10.30 a.m., and on Fridays we come on at 9.30 p.m., and that's on channel 992. Okay, we also produce Word of Deliverance, which comes on uh, <clears throat> Monday at 2 p.m. in the afternoon, and it comes on Thursday night at 10. We also have some other programs on television you might uh, want to look up, which is... Uh, truth behind the news. You've been listening to the word of deliverance, and I'm so glad you tuned in today. Remember, I believe if you learn to pray and fellowship with God, he'll never leave you and he'll never forsake you, but he'll be your present help in the time of trouble. I think there's nothing can replace Bible study and prayer, and you may be a person that can't get to a church where they're preaching the Bible. Well, if you can, there's nothing like group prayer and like a good group uh, Holy Ghost filled service. Spirit-filled service will change your life. And so uh, I would invite you to come with us if you'd like to send for one of our Bible questions, one of our some of the stuff that we create, the Bible commentaries and so forth. Just send me an email and we'll do it for you. You've been listening to the Word of Deliverance. I'm so glad you tuned in. I'm Brother Enman, and for Michelle and Melanie, have a great day.
Hello, I'm Pastor Inman, and thank you for tuning in to our program for today. We're going to take you deeper than you've ever been before, so don't change that dial. Today, we've got a wonderful subject for you. We're talking about the possibility of getting the gospel back into the hearts of people in America because we kind of, you know, see the handwriting on the wall, as Daniel said, and that's kind of where we're at today, that people have kind of turned away from God, and I believe that they have allowed themselves to be so programmed with this present world that it's just where we're at today. You know, uh, Michelle, we were talking about uh, God being jealous with the mind, and I know that's not what this program is about, but tell us exactly why you believe that the God, Bible said that we had to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, as well as all of our, our, our might, and with all of our strength. Tell us about the mind. Well, the mind is if you, whatever you put your mind to, that's what you're going to put your hands to. So if you're not thinking the right thing and if you don't have the mind of Christ then you really can't love him and you can't really be um, a good servant and you won't be profitable. So in other words he's jealous of you giving your mind over to something else in a sense that he's jealous of you with any other God because he know they're going to destroy you he know they're going to take you to hell and God is a jealous God. Right. He's jealous of your mind he don't want you programming your mind with things of the world and then claiming to love God. This is kind of a, a different deal here. Amen. You know, I don't think people ever talk about this, but that's why we are in the situation we're in. This country has, like I heard today, one of the uh, gospel guys say that for 50 years, our country has really been in the real problematic places. But I think it's uh, mainly they have raised all of us guys up here. You know, I'll be 70 years old in another year. <clears throat> and I think they brought us guys up to the point to where we've been raised with television. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had this thing coming at us all the time. And now today, you know, you see all of these things that's happening in the world. And everything is against Christianity. Melanie, I want to ask you today where we're going in this program with this. Because we know that Christianity has un been under attack. They're uh, trying to trash our Bible I heard yesterday that they had actually taken the Bible off the market in Australia. And now I guess it's begun to be against the law, if I understood that right. I mean, I read the article, but, you know, God forgive me if that's just not exactly perfect, but I think it is. They kind of trashed the sale of the Bible in Australia. So I don't know where they're going now with this, but I know where we are going today with our program. Tell us about the love nature and why we need to explain to people what the high calling of God that's in Christ Jesus, what it actually is. It's about it over in Ephesians chapter 3. It talks about being rooted and grounded in love. And I believe with this love nature that is, and when we say this love nature, that's the love of God. And, you know, in First John it says God is love. And in return, we're supposed to have that nature of love also, which is of God. And, you know, a lot of people, like you said, want to discredit our Bible and discredit Christianity and say that, oh, God is hate, God is this, God is that. But actually, God is love. And I believe it's, it's man in his ungenerated nature that can't love like God does. And the enemy works through man, and the man is not capable of having this love nature that, that God has. The only way for you to have it is through being born again, and God coming into your heart, you asking him and receiving him as your Savior. And in return, you take on his nature, you take on his power. And in this love nature, it gives you the ability to love your enemies. It gives you the ability to go higher than, than man can take you. It gives you the ability to go deeper and understand things that man can't understand. It gives you a wisdom that man can't have or can obtain only through God and his love and his nature and his power. Okay, well, they say to unsaved people a lot of times, that, well, I just don't want to give up this. I don't know if I'm ready yet. And I don't know if I can really do that. I don't think I really want to do that right now because me and my boyfriend's living together. And my son and his boyfriend is thinking about getting married nowadays. You know, they have kind of trashed the values and they want to move them into the church. But the real ideal is here that is in Ephesians chapter 3. This is very important mm -hmm. that Paul says that it's hard to understand. He said it's actually impossible in Ephesians 3.19 to understand the love of God. Now, we are born of God. Amen. Our nature is love. Amen. They have the sin nature now in man that comes from Genesis chapter 3. Mm -hmm. That uh, sin nature with birth in him whenever he turned around and 
and ate the fruit after the woman was deceived and gave him to eat, and he ate it. Mm -hmm. So what they saw um, is all the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life from 1 John chapter 2.15 is all birthed in the man. But they have overlooked the fact that we are born of love, and love can take us to a higher place than man can ever hope to go. Amen. It takes us higher in our morals. It takes us higher in our mind. It takes us higher in our ability. As a matter of fact, God loves every person. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it says that God will give us gifts that he doesn't give to regular men. Amen. Because we have power. That's what he talked about, Acts 1.8. Amen. Now, we know that they, uh, it says in Acts 1.8 that we shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon us. Amen. So the soil that these fruits in Galatians 5 is growing in is actually in our love, right? Amen, it is. It exactly is. It says, matter of fact, in 317 of Ephesians, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, and this is rooted and grounded in love. Mm -hmm. So now, let's get down to the very part of this program, because people today don't really understand what love is. And I see an attack going across our country now. In Missouri, in New York City, the other night they had like, a few hundred thousand people out there are ready to fight because a man was actually choked to death by a policeman, they said. And uh, somebody else was uh, killed in Missouri that, where they had all of that going on. That, But the idea is that uh, some people claim that they are actually Christians involved in this. Do you believe that? Um Maybe Christians are involved in it, but they're deceived and they're getting caught up into worldly affairs. I don't think a born-again Christian could be involved in it, but maybe there is some deception went on with backsliders or whatever. That's just my personal belief. But the idea is here that you cannot hate anybody and be a Christian. No, you can't. You can't be involved in things like that. And they have taken us today into a place in this country and tried to trash our Bible with all of these ideas that they come forth with on the history channels, and they've tried to trash our Bible and say that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene. And these are all these big corporations that actually run our government now. Mm-hmm. That's who they are. And uh, we're going to uh, ask you, Michelle, what have you got there laid out for us? Well, I know when you said when people are doing you wrong and, and doing things and thinking that, oh, well, they're doing this to us and we need to get back at them and but the Bible teaches differently. It says in Romans chapter 12, verse 14, Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. And it goes on verse 17. It says, Recompense to man, to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. And if it be possible, as much lieth as lieth.